Hello and today you're in for a new episode of our Don't Do This at Home series and after dissecting one of the most famous uh, chronograph movement of all time with the El Primero in my Zenith Tipo GP2, well today Peter will deconstruct another very famous movement, the Valjoux 7750, a movement fit for the job that you will find in many chronograph watches and in this case in my Breitling Navitimer. So let's join Peter for this new deconstruction and remember, don't do this at home. So. Today we are going to deconstruct a Breitling Navitimer, a modern Breitling Navitimer. The original Navitimer was made in the 1950s. The interesting element with, um, with the Navitimer is that it is one of those classic timepieces that is defined uh, a brand. And for Breitling this is probably historically the most famous watch that they will ever uh, have made. The original pieces were never water resistant and when you see an original 1950s Navitimer, the dials are, are often tarnished, the tachymeter tracks on the inside of the bezel uh, quite often have become <coughs> tarnished or slightly corroded in some fashion. Bringing the watch up to date today, you have the same basic aesthetic, the same proportions, the overall same size, but the, well, the cases are now entirely water resistant. So you have, in a sense, a much more practical, um, uh, much more practical watch, so to speak. Another difference is that the original Navi timers were manual wind; they had a different caliber. This one has a, a Valjoux 7750 automatic caliber inside of it, which <clears throat> is one of the most uh, industrial, uh, mass-produced, uh, highly accurate. Uh, calibers that has been produced for I'm guessing uh, around 50 years um, and continues to be made and used by a multitude of different companies today. So we have uh, one of the most classic timepieces uh, to have ever been designed and created with one of the most famous and one of the most classical chronograph calibers ever to have been produced. And now we are going to take the watch apart. We start as usual by removing the strap. So the the case back is uh, is held in place by being by screwing into the the center of the case. It has a multifaceted formed case back, and there is a, a special key that goes on the back and then unscrews it. That has already been done. So all I need to do is gently <coughs> unscrew it. The seal that goes between the case back and the center. And then you have the case back, which has all of the, the various different insignia, the, the description, the, the references on the case back. Once we've opened the, the case back, then we see the, the caliber, the 7750 inside. There are various different levels of quality um, with, the, with these calibers, which are today produced by ETA. So here, you see on the top, this is the rotor. Okay. And then that covers up um, about 50% of the caliber. And then once I've removed that, we'll be able to see the, the whole of the movement. So the rotor is held in place by a single screw holding the rotor in place. There you have the, it's the conventional form rotor that you find on all 7750s. Then when we look underneath, we can see the, the bore race with the teeth, which in turn, as the rotor is actually turning, which then wind up the automatic train. So you have the balance, which is over here, the regulating system, which is on top. This large bridge, which is predominant on top of the movement, this both supports the, the the rotor which screws here in the center as well as acts as a bridge holding down different elements of the chronograph such as the minute wheel which is here as well as the automatic system which is on the other side the it's a highly industrial mass-produced caliber but still there's a certain amount of attention which has been taken in relation to the finishing so you still have spotting on the the, the primary bridge 
here, which is like a, a three-quarter style bridge which goes around. You have spotting on the, um, the balance cock. And then you have uh, all of the steel work, and this is all of parts of the chronograph. This is all just a, an, a, an industrial electro finishing. So it is clean, uh, it's tidy, it's functional, and it gives quite a nice contrast with uh, the rest of the movement. So the way the watch is actually assembled, the movement is held in place, is that you have the movement set inside of a movement ring, which goes around the movement. And then that in turn sits into the center of the case. The movement ring is held in place by three screws and bridles, or movement clamps. And then the movement sits inside of that ring by being held in place by two additional screws and, uh, and clamps. Okay, so then you have the stem and uh, the winding crown uh, outside of the watch. And now I can remove the screws, which are then holding the movement ring inside of the case. Conventionally, both these specific screws and the bridles are made from, from stainless steel, from, from inox. Then, once the actual case is removed, the movement with the, the dial in the hands is left sitting on the, the casing cushion. We take the stem and we place it back into the movement. That allows me to be able to adjust the hands, aligning them to facilitate the process of removing them from the, from the movement. So as with all of the, the deconstructions, as always when dismantling a watch, to protect the dial and to prevent the hands from being ejected into the atmosphere, we cover the hands with a piece of transparent plastic so we can see what we're doing and then gently Okay, now the next thing we do is we always remove the dial before dismantling it any further because the dial is effectively one of the most delicate parts of the watch. To be able to remove the dial, I first have to take off the movement ring, which is held, on, held in place by two, two screws, by the two screws. Okay. So, <clears throat> there you have the, the movement ring. This is the ring which makes up the space between the inside of the, the actual case and the outside diameter of the caliber. The main plate has two holes which locate the two dial feet and then the dial is actually held in place by a hooking system which is fixed into the, the side of the, of the movement. To be able to release them you just pull the end of the hook and it pivots out. So it's just a small detail but there you have one Two. These are the two hook systems. They pivot on the inside and then when you close them, the pressure, there's a friction which pushes against the, the dial feet to hold it in place. Lift up the movement. And then you have the underside of the dial with the different references from the company. You can now see on the dial side, on the under dial side, you can see the, the calendar ring with the, the different pivots, which are all for the, the different hands of the, the chronograph. This pinion here with the, the five teeth, this is for the rapid date change for the, for the calendar. If you pull out the stem halfway in one direction, it then allows adjustment of the calendar disc. The other direction, it moves out of engagement. The wheel that is here, this is one of the, this is part of the calendar mechanism which then drives as this end tooth here 
it turns around once every 24 hours to then drive the, the data ring around. Then if I turn the watch over, you have the movement free of the rotor outside of the case. This system here, this is the main operating lever, which then pushes against the cam system. And then the lever, which is on the other side over here, this is then for returning to zero the chronograph. So if I push here, you can see the cam system moving backwards and forwards. Start and stop, start and stop. So in the dismantling process, the next part to be taken off is the top bridge here. This bridge which held the uh, rotor mass and holds down part of the automatic mechanism and the chronograph. So this is the, this is the bridge that I just removed. The centre section is where the ball race is then screwed on for the rotor. You turn it over, you can see the jewelled bush on the inside here, which is for the chronograph seconds. And you have this pin which sticks up here, which is for the pinion, which is one of the pinions for the one of the pinions for the automatic mechanism. And it's in a different colour because it's made from a material called cuberlium, which is very, very strong and very, very slippery. So the steel pinion which sits on top of that has very little friction as it's actually winding up the mainspring. All of these steel elements on this side, this is all part of the chronograph mechanism. The, the pink metal pieces which are here, this is for the um, automatic. And there's just one reverser block which implies that the automatic is just wound in one direction but they're all made from the same material as the previous pin that I mentioned, which is cuberlium. So it's very strong, virtually lubrication free, and is quite often used uh, by ETA in a lot of their, in their calibers, as well as by other companies. The piece that I'm holding is, uh, is a reverser block. So you have like a ratchet system inside of it, and you have a pinion, and as the rotor turns around, one direction it slips and in the other direction it winds. The pinion, which is underneath here, then meshes with this wheel. Made of the same material. And then the pinion, which is underneath it, in turn, then winds this wheel, which you see to the side. This large lever here and the tail of it is touching the, the cam. This is for the this is for the return to zero and you can see now it's in the return to zero position. So it's pushing down on those two those two cams. Okay. So this is these are the, the hammers for the return to zero. This spring is a spring which acted on it. Here, this is the minute recorder wheel, which I'm taking out. This is a bridge which holds a small pinion underneath it, which is here. And this is the pinion which then drives that chronograph hand, that chronograph wheel. The the calendar wheel is held in place by this plate and the one on the other side. So this is the this is the date disc which is held onto that large plate. The teeth and the the, the, the material of the the material of the date disc is made of a special kind of brass. It is not then treated so as to reduce the amount of friction between the, the raw component and the piece that it then sits on. And then there is a disc that then sits on top of the, of the movement, held down by three screws. Okay, so that's the, the, the sole purpose of this disc is for the calendar mechanism and the other components for the, the calendar mechanism. 
the finger piece which then engages and turns the disc. This is the hour wheel. This is a, this piece here is the um, is conventionally known as the chaussée or cannon pinion. This is the piece that the actual minute hand sits on, and then in turn you have the hour wheel which then sits on top of the cannon pinion. The wheel which is here, this is the uh, this is part of the chronograph. It's the hour. It's the uh, the hour wheel. The hour recording hand then sits on this extended pivot. It's driven underneath by a by the pinion, which in turn meshes with the the, the mechanism for the for the barrel. Okay, you have these two components. You have this nylon brake and you have the steel hammer. The hammer goes down to return the hour recorder to zero and the piece above it is the synthetic uh, lever here. This is a form of brake. You can see the underside of the dial with all of the calendar mechanism and the remaining chronograph mechanism all removed. To continue the process of dismantling the watch we will now dismantle, or we will now remove, the chronograph wheel. Again, this is the wheel upon which the chronograph hand actually sits. You have the cam again at the top, which is acted upon by the hammers to return it to zero. And you have a little small spring underneath which is the piece which is actually pushing around an intermediate wheel to turn the minute recorder wheel so that every 60 seconds that the chronograph wheel turns it then couples with an intermediate which then turns the minute recorder wheel by one minute. That in turn sits upon this small spring with this small nylon ring and that is to take up any slack between the, um, the teeth, the triangular shaped teeth, around that wheel. And then... And then we have full visibility on the, the cam system here. Okay, before removing before removing the, the cam assembly, I'm going to take off this bridge, which is still linked to the automatic mechanism. So this is the final bridge before the main three-quarter bridge, which holds in place parts of the automatic mechanism. And the top section you have still parts of the chronograph mechanism which sit. Okay, this is the final wheel which then meshes with the ratchet wheel which winds up the barrel. This is the, the last wheel before the ratchet wheel which links with the automatic mechanism. And then you have what is the brain of the mechanism for the chronograph which is this cam assembly here, which is on three different levels. Each level having a different function, affecting different levers or centering pools, which allow the, the chronograph to both start, stop, and then be returned to zero. Or to prevent the return to zero from being activated if the, the watch is actually still running, if the chronograph is still running. That is the main operating lever. That is the piece, and it has the little V-shape, little V-shaped end here. This is the piece which then is turning that cam system backwards and forwards so that it starts and stops the chronograph mechanism. And that little paddle at the side is the component or the piece, which in turn is what is being pushed by the pusher, the, um, the inside section of the pusher at two o'clock on the case. This small lever here traverses the movement and it affects the functioning of the chronograph mechanism, the hour recorder on the other side of the watch. 
I'm going to remove the cam mechanism. That's actually the brain of the watch. So that is the main cam system which is being toggled backwards and forwards. Three different cams all fixed together on three different levels. This is a, a spring which pushes against that cam to make sure that every time it has its, its, it is pushed, it is activated, it will sit in one specific position. The actual click, I don't know if you can see this, but the click for the ratchet wheel is just a single bit of wire, which is here. So you move that to one side, and then you can release the ratchet wheel and let the power down. One direction, it winds up. The other direction, it winds down. Not the most elegant system in the world, but efficient, it works. And for the most part, as the watch is actually working, it doesn't really do anything because the tension is taken by the automatic mechanism. This is most, mostly used when the watch is actually being assembled or, or even dismantled. Okay, so that is the, the ratchet wheel with its square hole in the center which is what sits on top of the barrel arbor that then winds up the mainspring. You can see the regulating mechanism, which is here. Which is here. And literally, you have a little arrow, and there's these little calibrations on the lever. If you move, the cali if you move this little arrow to one side, then it'll make the watch go faster by effectively shortening the balance spring. And if you turn it, push it in the opposite direction, the little index here will go in the opposite direction and the opposing direction and effectively make the balance spring slightly longer, causing the watch to run slower. It feels like every screw has actually been tightened by Arnold Schwarzenegger on this watch. Okay. Okay, and there you have there you have the balance assembly, the, um, the balance cock, the index, and uh, the balance and its balance spring all together as one, one assembly. The next piece I'm going to take off is the, the pallet bridge, Swiss lever bridge. So here you have the, the Swiss lever and its cock or bridge which is then holding it in place. The upper crown wheel which meshes with uh, the stem here and then in turn manually winds up the, the ratchet wheel which would be to the side. I'm just going to remove that. And then you have one large bridge here which in turn holds the, the barrel, the rest of the going train and you have all of the chronograph mechanism which is then fitted on top. Okay, so that is the main train bridge and barrel bridge. <clears throat> Once we've removed the main bridge and we've removed the, the hack, we have the barrel and the full train. So this is what is conventionally called the second wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel with this extended pivot for the constant seconds. Then you have the escape wheel, which then transmits power to the lever. And the barrel. So all of the components, all of the wheels, all of the automatic mechanism, all of the chronograph is now removed. The only thing which is left is the, the, the stem and the setting mechanism, which for, this, for the for, for dismantling, for servicing, normally you can leave it like that unless there are parts which require changing. Or if the watch is very, very dirty and then those comp components will need to be dismantled as well. Other than that, normally they can be left in place. Okay, and the elements which were visible have been decorated, so that's why you have the spotting. Everything else which is uh, which is matte 
um, is covered up by various different components so isn't actually visible. But then the whole watch movement, when the watch is completely assembled inside of the case, none of the movement is visible. On the under dial side, like you see the, the, shock, the, the Inca block shock protection here. These are the two hooks that hold in place the, the dial feet. This is the, the cover plate and the setting lever spring, which then hold which then hold all of the, the setting mechanism in place. If I take the watch, and as I push the crown, you can see the setting mechanism. In this position, it's in winding. The first position, this is the rapid date change. And then in the third position is to set the time. And there you have it. That is the, um, that is an ETA seven seven fifty, completely dismantled from a Breitling Navitimer. The caliber is genuinely one of the most efficient, reliable, accurate mass-produced calibers that has probably ever been made. From a watchmaker's point of view, it's not the most fun product to dismantle and reassemble because there are so many pieces of wire. Um, it's a kind of, um, it sounds contradictory from a watchmaker's point of view, but it's fiddly. It's, um, it's quite uh, challenging on occasions to dismantle. Sometimes the, the higher the quality of the product, the easier the assembly. With the lesser expensive, the more time is actually consumed in actually in the final assembly and even in the dismantling process. Now, having said that, it is a good product. It is something it would never have survived for the period that it has done and would be would not continue to be manufactured today if it wasn't something which had been proven and it genuinely has been proven. But not my not my prefer my preference in chronographs hope you enjoyed this and that it has given you another perspective on this rather iconic movement all the best thanks for your time thanks to our patrons and viva watchmaking Send me, me.